Small Steps, Chapter 16. Christmas. Right foot first, Joseph said softly. The reader continued. As the familiar words rang out, Joseph and Mary slowly made their way to the manger. My legs were far too weak to support my weight without my sticks, but Kenny's strong grip never loosened, and he practically carried me the whole way. Even so, I was glad I had my shoes on. Our progress was slower than the reader's voice, so when we were only halfway to the front, he quit reading and waited for us to catch up with the story. When we got to the creche, Kenny helped me sit down on the chair on one side of the manger, and he sat on the other side. The reader continued, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger. A nurse from the pediatrics ward stepped forward and placed the baby in the manger. The other characters entered on cue. Dorothy looked suitably angelic with gauze wings trailing behind her wheelchair and a halo on her head. The wise men entered last, two in wheelchairs and one in braces, carrying gifts that looked suspiciously like decorated jewelry boxes we had made in OT the week before. We had been directed to hold still while Alice sang her solo. Every character except one followed instructions. Jesus kicked his feet and waved his fists at us. Alice's voice rang out confidently from the back of the room. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Her rendition was flawless, clear, true notes strung together in a necklace of sound, a gift for everyone in the room to wear. The last sleep in heavenly peace echoed for several seconds in the silence as visitors, staff, and patients wiped tears from their cheeks. Then thunderous applause broke out. Everyone talked at once, exclaiming how perfect the pageant had been. Miss Ballard rushed forward with my walking sticks, afraid she had let me do too much. Kenny did all the work for me, I said, which was true. The parents of the baby scooped him up from the manger and beamed while others admired him. But the real star that night was Alice, and she shone brilliantly. Except for her four roommates, and whichever nurses had listened outside her door, no one had known until then what a lovely voice she had. She was congratulated and complimented over and over. People asked if she took voice lessons. She blossomed under all the attention, smiling graciously and talking with anyone who approached her. Refreshments were served and our appetites immediately returned. We drank cranberry punch and stuffed ourselves with Christmas cookies, fruitcake, and candy canes. When the party ended, the five of us went back to our room and celebrated by ourselves. Long after the lights were out, we continued to talk and sing and eat. The next day, Miss Ballard told me I could go home for a Christmas visit. You don't sound very happy about it, I said. I prefer to keep you at the sheltering arms where I can control your activities, she admitted. You've made excellent progress, and you could undo it all by getting too tired or by trying to do something you aren't ready for and damaging a muscle. She shrugged. But I don't have the heart to say no to your parents. I'll be careful, I promised. I'm much stronger than I was on the first visit. After days of practice with Miss Ballard, I could walk a step or two. With luck, I'd be able to make it to the front door of my house on my own. Art will be home for the holidays, I told Miss Ballard. He and Dad plan to make a chair out of their hands and carry me up and down the stairs so I can use the big bathroom and sleep in my own bed. Miss Ballard clapped her hands over her ears and said she did not want to know about it until after I was safely back at the sheltering arms. I was not the only patient in 202 to receive a Christmas pass. Dorothy and Renee were going home, too. Shirley's parents and her two younger sisters were coming to spend Christmas Day with her. I was glad that she and Alice would have company. Two days before we were scheduled to leave, Dorothy got pneumonia and her visit home was canceled. She had trouble breathing, which scared all of us. We knew that if she got worse, she would be moved to University Hospital and put back in an iron lung. When my parents came to get me, my joy was marred by my concern that when I returned, Dorothy might be gone. All of my roommates now seemed like sisters, and I desperately wanted Dorothy to get well and I wanted her to stay at the sheltering arms with me. This time, my visit went smoothly. I was able to keep my balance in the car, and I managed the front steps on my own. Grandpa had tears in his eyes as he held the door open and watched me walk in with my sticks, but I knew they were tears of happiness. My only real difficulty was BJ, who was glad to see me, or was so glad to see me that he kept wagging around my ankles. We all worried that I would trip over him or that he would knock one of my sticks out of my hand. Dad wanted BJ shut in the basement. BJ has to go to the basement, I said. I'm going with him. BJ was allowed to stay near me, but I spent a lot of the time sitting down just so my dog wouldn't get in trouble. Because I was stronger and able to move more easily, I didn't get so tired on this second visit. 
I wore my new placid, or plaid satin dress and sat in my usual place on the sofa for our Christmas Eve gift exchange. I gave Grandpa, Art, and Mother, and Dad fancy Christmas cards I had made in our tea. I felt like one of the family again. When it was time to go to bed, Mother carried my walking sticks up the stairs. Art and Dad made the chair out of their hands, and I sat down and held onto their necks, and we went up. It looked fine, but I was glad Miss Ballard wasn't there to watch. At the top of the stairs, Mother gave me my sticks, and I walked eagerly to my own bedroom. Or was it my own bedroom? I stood in the doorway, totally stunned. Surprise, Mother said. Merry Christmas, Dad said. They had completely redecorated my room. The walls and furniture had been painted, and a new white bedspread covered my bed. Buffalo curtains now framed the windows, and a new lamp shone from the bedside table. I could barely hide my disappointment. I had thought a hundred times about my comfortable room with its worn bedspread and familiar furniture. I had longed to see it all again, and now that room was gone forever. Not even, or even the closet was clean. Wow, I said, trying to act thrilled. The redone bedroom seemed less like my own room than room 202 did, and I fell asleep wondering how Dorothy was. In the morning, I decided I liked my new room, and that I that evening I left reluctantly for the sheltering arms. It had been good to be home again, and I had gotten around fairly well. Still, I knew I had a ways to go before I was well enough to come home for good. For one thing, Dad and Art would not be there all the time to carry me up and down the stairs. I braced myself for bad news as I entered room 202. Much to my relief, Dorothy was sitting up in bed, looking well. Look, she said the minute I arrived. She held her arm toward me. My great aunt in Montana sent me a watch. Dorothy's parents were extremely poor, and she said she had never dreamed she would have a watch of her own. She sent me a new dress, too, Dorothy said. As soon as I'm well enough to get up, I'll wear it. That night, the five of us talked long after lights out. Renee told what she had done at home. Shirley told about the visit from her parents and sisters. My mom came, Dorothy said, and my brother, who was on leave from the army. Even Alice had some exciting news. An uncle had come on Christmas Day to visit her. After all of December's festivities, January seemed as dull as last month's newspapers. The days were short, and so were our tempers. Shirley caught a cold and had to stay in bed. Dorothy was over the pneumonia, but her braces didn't fit properly. They were returned and a new pair ordered. Even with new OT projects and another edition of The Clutch, the hospital newsletter, we were bored and restless. Despite blizzards and icy roads, Mother and Dad came every Sunday. One trip, Mother told me she had visited the little kids' ward. They don't have enough toys for those children, she said. Little ones can't read to entertain themselves the way you can. I sensed that she was leading up to something, and I was right. I was thinking, she went on. That you have outgrown many of your toys, and maybe you would like to donate them to the sheltering arms. Like what? I asked. Your table and chairs, for one thing. They're much too big to fit in the chairs anymore, and they're just taking up space at home. I agreed to donate my table and chairs. And your dolls. You haven't played with dolls for years, and there aren't enough dolls for all the children in that ward. Not my raggedies, I said, and not Marilyn or the storybook dolls, but you can give the rest away. Mother nodded. What about all your books? The little children would enjoy looking at the pictures hesitated. I couldn't use the table and chairs, even if I wanted to, and I didn't mind giving away the dolls as long as I got to keep my favorites, but my books? I felt sorry for the little kids, too, but there were limits to my generosity. Apparently, there were no limits to mothers. You haven't read those kitty books in years, she pointed out. Your health is improving so quickly, and some of the children in that ward are badly crippled. She made me feel like a selfish ogre. I want to keep my raggedy Ann books, I said. Fine, she said. I'll pack up all the rest. I wanted to keep my other books, too, but I didn't have the nerves to say so. How could I complain about giving away Donkey Donkey when I had not looked at it in five years? The next Sunday, the car bulged with my belongings. In addition to dolls, books, and the table and chairs, Mother brought every toy in good condition that I hadn't played with in recent memory. There were balls, boxes of crayons, stuffed animals, and games. She even brought in my doll buggy, the one I used to push Raggedy Ann in. Some little girl who can't walk alone... Can't yet walk alone. Might be able to walk by holding on to your buggy, Mother said. I wanted to protest, but I could not dispute the facts. I was too big for that doll buggy, and most of the kids in the children's ward were worse off than I was. Mother had a wonderful time distributing everything to the youngsters in the children's ward. Then, glowing with pride in her son, unselfish daughter, she told everyone it was all my idea. Although my parents set a generous example, I never got any pleasure from watching the little kids use my possessions. 
Every time I saw my doll buggy or my maple table and chairs, I thought of home and how uncomplicated life used to be. When I saw a little boy reading Donkey Donkey, I fought the urge to grab it away from him and hide it under my bed. That's the end of chapter 16. You have to come back for chapter 17.